Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm super stoked to be here at the GraphQL Summit. Uh, thank you, Apollo, for inviting me. And yes, I'm going to be talking about GraphQL and Rust. I think it's a match made in heaven. Uh, to be clear, this is Rust, the programming language, not the video game. So I know people get that confused sometimes. Um, but yeah. First, a little bit about me. I'm an engineering manager at Robinhood. I manage our business automation team. So what we do is uh, try to automate humans and machines to make it so Robinhood isn't this big brokerage with a ton of humans faxing things back and forth. Um, but before that, I was actually retired, surfing around for three years, and picked up Rust on the side because I'd been managing for a while and uh, kind of missed programming. And Rust seemed like a good thing to learn, and I'll be talking about that. Before that, I was at Facebook, Mozilla, and Apple. Um, I really love GraphQL, and I really love Rust, so apologies if this comes off as like a Rust fanboy. Um, I maintain Juniper, which is the Rust. Oh, this is not going forward. Sorry about this. Let me fix my slides. There we go. Sorry about that. So I maintain Juniper. Uh, this is a Rust server-side GraphQL library. Um, my other claim to fame with GraphQL is I was in the room when GraphQL was invented at Facebook, which was pretty exciting. I was part of the team that uh, rewrote our mobile apps and kind of got our act together on mobile. Uh, but I had nothing to do with it. So <laughs> I take no credit with GraphQL whatsoever. Uh, I also work at Robinhood with Lee Byron, who is the co-creator of GraphQL, and he is gracing us with his presence right here in the front row supporting me. So thanks, Lee. I believe he's also the head of the GraphQL Foundation. Yeah. Is that true? Yes. Um, so there's a lot of GraphQL stuff in my world, and um, you could too. We're hiring. As a manager, I think I'm legally obligated to say this. OK, so what is Rust? Um, so on the website, the Rust language team says, it is a language empowering everyone to build reliable and efficient software. And that sounds really great to me, because I like reliable and I like efficient software. Hopefully you do too. But why would you use Rust? The first thing I think that's really compelling to me is performance. So Rust is just ridiculously, blazingly fast and memory efficient. Um, it has no runtime and no garbage collector. So when you're putting Rust in production, you're not tweaking a garbage collector. You're not doing a bunch of that sort of stuff. Um, you're not dealing with runtime abstractions that are high cost. Um, you only pay for the abstractions that you use. So generally, Rust is going to be as fast as like C or C++, and it has some additional nice features on top of it. I don't know about you, but I don't trust myself to write C or C++, period, let alone uh, accepting stuff from the internet. So. Uh, I don't know if folks have seen this before. This is the Tech Empower benchmarks. They may be true, they may be not true. Benchmarks are always taken with a giant grain of salt. But for most of these, Rust is in the top five, if not the top one. And um, this particular one, these two purple bars on the top, are two different um, Rust frameworks. And you can see there's a lot going on in these slides. But these are, this is the languages. The top two are Rust. And there's C, and there's Go, and Java, and C++, Go, Java, C++. Um, and so in production on the server side, people are often seeing Rust be 10 or 100 times faster than comparable code written in Node, or uh, Python, or Ruby. or uh, And of course, the gap is smaller vers versus things like Java, or Go, and things like that. So um, it is not absurd to write something in Rust, and the first time it is much faster than you could ever imagine in your normal language. And to me, that just blows my mind, quite honestly. Uh, because there's no garbage collection, because memory is manually managed, typically uh, Rust also uses 1 to 10 times less memory. Um, so even if you're doing something that's CPU bound, that maybe when the Java JIT kicks in and, and it's one for one in speed, usually Rust's memory is a lot lower. And as the industry moves to things like serverless, this becomes more and more important. You need things to be fast, and you have memory overhead, 
and uh, you'll obviously want to use as few resources as possible. So that's OK. Like C is that fast. Uh, C++ is that fast. Um, other language are. What is the benefit of Rust over those? I, Rust also is reliable. So it has a type system that prevents bugs. The type system is very similar to TypeScript, if you've used it, um, generics, all these sorts of stuff. It guarantees memory safety and thread safety. So going multiple threads, um, uh, distributing computation is pretty safe in Rust. In C++, I don't know about you, but I would not trust myself to do threads and memory stuff in C++. Just, just asking for security bugs, asking for crashes, and things like that. And, and Rust gives you some tools to make that a lot more safe. Uh, variables are immutable by default. If you've ever used immutable.js in JavaScript, you kind of know the benefits of that. This is another foot gun Rust takes away from you and kind of does best practices by default in the language. And one of the things I really like is Rust makes error handling explicit. Um, you have to handle the case, or you have to explicitly say, I do not care about these error cases. So in other languages, for example, if you get a path back from the operating system, a path is just a string, right? Well, strings can be encoded in different ways. And on some operating systems, like Windows, you can have different character sets that maybe don't map to Rust's native string type. For 99.9999% of people, we don't care about that. But that 0.1% may care about it. So in Rust, you explicitly have to say, do I care about this case? If not, just soldier on. If I do care about this case, handle the error. But you have to cognitively do it. The system just doesn't handle it for you. And then for me, it's really important that Rust is practical. Um, and there, Mozilla created Rust because they had a practical need and they wanted to put it in production. It's not some research language that's in ivory tower research. It, it is made to integrate with the real world. And uh, other languages, that may not be the case. So one I think is really nice about Rust, similarly with Go, it has single binary deployments. You don't need to bring a JVM. You don't have to bundle and all this sort of stuff. You build a binary, and you can put it in Docker and things like that and run it. Um, another thing I love about Rust is Rust can act like C to integrate with other languages. So almost every language has to in talk to C, have some extension point. In Python, NumPy, a lot of the stuff underneath is written in C to make it fast. Um, very often in Node.js, let's say you're doing image resizing, you're using the very popular Sharp um, NPM package. That's actually implemented in C++ under the hood. And um, so Node, uh, Python, the JVM, all these other languages usually have an interface to include C code and call it and call back and forth. And because Rust can act like C, you can write a high quality library in Rust and bring it to your existing service written in another language and get the benefits of Rust in that very small language domain. And you don't have to rewrite the world. And that's very practical. And I think it's very hard to get adoption for a language, even if it's 10 times better, if you have a ton of code already existing. Um, so this is critical for Rust actually being used. And we're seeing it being used more and more. And for me, I'm lazy when I was surfing in Mexico and waiting for good waves. Um, you know, I thought about what I wanted to learn, and Rust kind of ran everywhere. It runs on Windows, it runs on Linux, it runs on iOS, it runs on Android. You can even compile it for the web and run it in the browser via WebAssembly. And this seems pretty cool that potentially down the road you could learn one language, and regardless of where you're working or what problem domain you're working in, your Rust skills might actually be relevant and help. And something that I think is really important is the Rust community is welcoming. It has a great community, has a code of conduct that people adhere to. The documentation is amazing and human friendly. A lot of the Rust core developers are hardcore C++ people who have worked on Firefox, worked at Facebook, worked at Google. And the C++ community does some amazing things, but they're also kind of like, oh, if you have that bug, that just means you're not a good C++ programmer. And there's this kind of gatekeeping. And Rust is like, we know we're not good. We know the compilers are good. Like, let's trust in the machines, and we're all just kind of trying to figure it out. So there's not a chip on people's shoulders. Um, the compiler errors are very useful and very informative, very similar to Elm, if you've ever used Elm. And um, Rust encourages open source contributions. So all the Rust language stuff is in GitHub, in PRs, uh, all the 
organizational changes happen in the open. So that's really cool that you as a community member are on the same footing as people maybe at Mozilla or at other companies that are heavily involved and use Rust. Um, where is Rust used? I, I don't need to pontificate about how much I like it or, or don't need to do quotes. I think the proof is in the pudding of people actually using Rust. So large parts of Firefox are written in Rust. This is why it was designed as a language. And AWS is Lambda VM. Rust. So if you're running code on Lambda, it's running on top of Rust. Uh, Facebook's Mercurial server, server, which is critical, right? If that goes down, if that has correctness bugs, like game over. Uh, the new Libra stuff, Cloudflare, Chrome OS. So Rust is starting to creep in everywhere where speed, correctness, and um, safety is necessary. And I would argue you want those three things all the time. OK, so why not Rust? Steep learning curve, not going to lie. Uh, I'm not, I don't have a system programming background, and it was pretty steep for me. Uh, very small ecosystem. Frequently, you will try to do something. A library will not be there. Um, but when it is there, it is generally high quality. And then long compile times. It's a compiled time language. It's not as fast as Go when you compile it. And uh, that's a huge bummer when you're iterating. So I think those are the biggest three. OK, that was enough Rust evangelizing. Um, I think it's compelling. You may not. But I think with GraphQL and Rust, it is materially um, compelling. So I'm going to talk about those interactions, and we'll just basically be stepping through code for the most of the time. Um, we'll see how we do on time. So like I said, I maintain the Rust, Gra Rust GraphQL server library Juniper. So you can grab my slides and click there later. All these examples are going to be using Juniper. Can you see this OK? Yeah. OK, so on the left is the GraphQL schema we're going to be doing, and on the right is Rust. So hopefully you folks are familiar with GraphQL. This is us defining a person object and some fields. Email is a string. That's non-nullable. Age is an int. That's non-nullable. How do we do that in Rust? It looks basically exactly the same way. So uh, Rust's objects are called structs. Um, we say it's a person. Say it's an email. Say it's a string, int. Um, probably I should have done an unsigned int here. Again, Rust is a bit low level, so you can't just say int or number. You have to actually say the size of what you're doing. But that's just pure Rust. There's nothing GraphQL about that. How do we, how do we like convert it to this GraphQL schema? How do we make it GraphQL aware? With Juniper, this is all you need to do. It's basically just a simple annotation that's like derive GraphQL object. And that attaches all the GraphQL machinery on this particular object, on this particular struct. Um, so when you query for person email, it will use the, the attribute in that object. Pretty straightforward. Now let's say we have something like password hash that we don't want our clients to be able to query. Uh, Juniper has a way to say, skip it. So this is very intuitive, very quick, not a ton of boilerplate, just really get to, to the point. And uh, this is not a DSL. This is just standard Rust. These attributes and all this stuff is standard Rust. OK, but you just can't just have an object. You have to have a whole, whole schema in order to query it. So let's walk through a schema in GraphQL and a schema in Rust. So we have our person object from the previous slide. Uh, we have to have a top level query. So let's do this. We're going to have an everyone field, and that's going to have a list of uh, persons. And in, in Rust, it's basically exactly the same. The query is just an object. It's one of the nice things about GraphQL. So in Rust, it does have arrays, but they're, they're kind of wonky. Um, so you can imagine this is a vector, which is basically just like an array that can go um, big and small. And you can see in this slide, Rust has generics. So vector is a container. Uh, and the type in the vector is a person, very similar to TypeScript and, and other languages that have generics. In this particular example, we do not have a mutation. So that's just an empty object in GraphQL. In Rust, we have a, a nice typed thing that you can say this is empty to make sure you don't accidentally add fields or stuff onto it. And then you take the query, the quick, take the mutation, put them together, and that's your schema. And uh, that's how you do it in Rust with Juniper. So very straightforward, looks very similar to the GraphQL schema. And it's pretty insane that this is all you need to do that. This is a low-level system language, supposedly. And this looks very high-level and almost like Python and very similar to GraphQL. But that's not telling us too much. So GraphQL has this great feature called descriptions, I hope people know, of because everything in GraphQL is introspective, um, 
you know, you want to say, what is the email? What is age? Maybe they're straightforward here, but, but it might change in the future. So in GraphQL, you can do this with string literals. On the left, you can say, oh, a person in our system, this is the email they used to register, and the self-reported age. How you do that in Rust are comments. So Rust has multiple types of con comments. The first one is just your standard two slashes. That's just like a normal comment. Um, but three slashes are doc comments. So you may be familiar with these from um, Java and, and things of that nature. This is built into the Rust language. So um, anyone not familiar with GraphQL, not familiar, anyone familiar with Rust would know exactly what that is and would know intuitively how to add uh, comments, which would then show up in your GraphQL schema. Uh, I, this is a good time to introduce Cargo. So Cargo is like NPM, but better for Rust. So when you download Rust, Cargo is your main way to like start builds and add dependencies and, and uh, run tests and all that sort of stuff. And Cargo has this cool feature that you can run Cargo doc on your Rust project, and it will take these doc comments that are littered throughout your screen, or your, your code, and will generate documentation for you. So you get this nice documentation that has all these links. This is all local. Uh, you get all your comments in line, and you can see there's this trait implementation. Traits are like interfaces in other languages, um, kind of like functions you can attach to an object. And you can see, because we annotated with that GraphQL object thing, that, OK, yeah, a person has an email. It has an age, but it has a, also has all this gobbledygook, this GraphQL type. And that's the magic that does it behind the scenes. Uh, I'm not going to go over this gobbledygook, because it's not a, a Rust training uh, presentation. You can do cool things because this is in the language. You can do that anyway in other languages. You can extract comments and make documentation, but this is in the language. This is in every Rust project, and it ties into all the other nice infrastructure in Rust. So you can say, OK, I want to actually deny missing docs. I want my code to not even compile if it doesn't have documentation. And you, get, you would get stuff like this. You're missing documentation for a struct, where it is, exactly where it is, and underlined. Um, so this is really great, and this helps your, your, your code scale. R Rust error messages are out of this world. But what's nice, this happens at compile time. Out of the box, you don't have to add stuff on it. You don't have to add linters. You don't have to add a separate test for this. It's just in Rust. And that blows my mind. Um, Rust took first class like comments as first class citizens in the language. So a couple things to point. Let's say we, we put this doc comment on top of our person. Uh, to show an example of how to use it. Well, the first thing is we have the back ticks. Everyone kind of does that, does markdown, I think, naturally now with GitHub and with all this sort of stuff. It's table stakes. Uh, Rust supports markdown in comments natively. So if you do markdown, when you do that cargo doc, you'll get all your nice formatting, all that sort of stuff. Um, usually, you put a nice example, especially if you're doing a library for other consumers. You're like, hey, here's how to use my library. Do this, maybe don't do that. Rust kind of takes it to the next extreme and will extract code in comments and run them as tests with your tests. And that prevents your examples in your documentation from getting out of sync with the actual implementation. So if later I, I made um, the age, which is here, 42, if later I made that a unsigned int and, or passed it in a string, it would fail at compile time. So yeah, cargo test runs code and docs as tests. This is really great. There's a couple projects, I think, for JavaScript, Java, that extract stuff and then will run them. But I don't have to deal with it. And I just know in every time I'm writing Rust, it'll just do the right thing. Um, OK, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to blast through this sort of stuff. Uh, so let's say we want to add a UUID. Um, we want to tell people to not use the email anymore. GraphQL has this great feature. Uh, deprecated, you can say, don't use this field. We have the same exact thing on Rust. This is built into Rust, almost the same. Um, so you can do this not only in context of GraphQL, as well as in the context of your Rust code. And similarly, as in GraphQL, you can actually give a reason why. You can say, hey, like, don't use email, use UUID. In Rust, same thing. It's deprecated, use UUID. <coughs> and again, because it's all built in Rust, you can do similar things like, don't let my code use this deprecated thing. And you can poke holes in it and say, OK, don't let anyone use this deprecated thing. But for my GraphQL endpoint, I'll let people use it. And you can really pick and choose and move your code base forward 
and it's built into Rust. All right, let's go through a, a, what a more complicated example looks like. So we had our person, but we're now adding a can vote bool field in GraphQL. Um, so we have to kind of expand what that annotation GraphQL object was doing. So what we do is we say, hey, this is now a Juniper object, and this is an implementation for a person. And we say, OK, here's an email. It's now a function call. And now we can do anything we want. Here, we're just returning the email. Here, we're just returning the age. Here, we're actually doing some calculations and some code. This should look very familiar if, you're, uh, if you've used other languages, server-side language with GraphQL. And I think that's sort of the magic here, is you get all these crazy improvements. You get all these benefits. And it doesn't really hurt you as a developer. It still feels like you're writing Python or you're writing JavaScript code. Um, OK, let's say we add an age label for, so if your age is a certain range, we want to return a, a specific uh, string. In this case, we're returning a result. So like I said, Rust has good errors. Um, and so we're saying this could fail. And whenever we return something from this function, we have to say, is that case a success case, which, is, um, which, is, which we denote with OK? Or is that case a failure case? which we denote with uh, error. And because we're matching on different values, OK, if it's 0 through 1, do this. If it's 3 to 4, do that. We have to match all values. Otherwise, Rust would not compile. So we have to handle the case where we don't know. So Rust just like makes us handle that and decide what to do and decide if that is a failure case or a, um, or a success case. And Juniper, just like any standard backend stuff, when you query it, it returns the data that it can fetch, but also returns the errors automatically. All that plumbing is just handled for you. Uh, Rust maps very closely to GraphQL schema. So we have enums, we have interfaces, we have traits, we have all this sort of stuff. Very straightforward. And there's always an escape valve of if the Juniper auto stuff of, OK, it'll take terrible twos and it'll just capitalize it. But if you want it to be terrible underscore twos, you can, you can override it. Uh, very quickly, n plus 1 in GraphQL is a thing. It's still a thing in Rust. It's just inherent in the problem space. Graph Juniper, the library, gives you a look ahead, and it's up to you how to use it. Uh, we do have a data loader um, thing in Rust. We have eager loading, so if you want to load everything up front and then pass it through, you can do that. Um, we have ways to go from your GraphQL code, or sorry, your Rust code to your schema. Um, so if you want to use other tools like Apollo, you can have a nice schema, keep your source of truth in Rust and just, uh, just print out the schema. Or you can have a schema language and generate all this Juniper boilerplate. You can go the other way, and there's a project for that. You can run GraphQL. You can have a client. It can run uh, in the browser via web WebAssembly. Or if you just need to write tooling on top of GraphQL, there's a parser. Um, for further reading, the Rust book is very good. It's free. It's online. And it's very newbie friendly. The Juniper book for GraphQL is a work in progress, but is pretty, pretty good. And uh, we have an end-to-end -end example of using Rust uh, with GraphQL with a database. And if you need help, please contact me on Twitter. I'm very passionate about GraphQL and Rust. That's all I got. Thank you very much. <laughs>